All right, so keynote time. Happy to have Katie here today. Um, she's the C, uh, CEO of her own company now called Luda Security. Uh, she creates robust vulnerability coordination programs, um, great expertise on bug bounty programs. She recently testified as an expert in bug bounties in the labor market for security research for the U.S. Senate. Has also been called upon the European Parliament hearings for dual use technology. Later, she was invited by the U.S. Uh, State Department to renegotiate the Wassinger Arrangement. Wassenaar, I never heard of right. She'll heckle me. Um, I don't know what you know about that, but it's a pretty big deal. And she was working hard to get exemptions, technical exemptions, for the vulnerability disclosure and incident response portions of it. 20 years of experience in security, penetration tester at, at stake, uh, part of uh, Microsoft vulnerability research, bug bounties at Microsoft, launched those, advised the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, resulting in the Hack the Pentagon program. She's also an author, co-editor of an ISO standard about vulnerability disclosure. Um, she's been traveling all over the world. Um, super happy to get her here. I was a little worried it wasn't going to happen with our crazy travel schedule. Um, so thrilled to have her here. Uh, if you help me welcome them to the stage, my friend Katie Moe. Thanks, Jake. Okay, so I am very happy to see you all this morning. Um, I heard the uh, after party last night was a hit. I couldn't make it because I don't know what time zone I'm in. I think I'm somewhere over Russia. Don't hold that against me. So, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about basically being fooled by some of the myths in our industry and what we can do about it. Um, as Jake kindly reminded you all, I have expertise in vulnerability coordination and, uh, and creating robust programs in the background to deal with the vulnerabilities that you find, um, whether you find them yourself or through some outsiders, uh, through vuln coordination or bug bounties. So we're going to do a little myth busting this morning and hopefully make the industry a better place and do a little course correcting. It is true that I have over 20 years of experience professionally in, uh, in security. Before that, I was a molecular biologist, and I worked on the Human Genome Project. Don't let my looks fool you. I actually literally have never gone outside in my life. So um, this is a list of things that I've done. Jake did a good job of covering it. The word cloud, if you don't follow me on Twitter, I'm Katie Mo, K8EM0. And uh, the word cloud is a Twitter word cloud about things that I tweet about a lot and find very, very important. So you can imagine you will find me at karaoke later tonight. Let me know if you want to join. Um, so this was, uh, this was real congressional testimony. And uh, that was really me making T-Rex arms in front of the Senate because they couldn't pronounce my last name, just in case you're wondering. It's Mosaurus, like a dinosaur. So <laughs> 20 years ago, my friends that I grew up with as a kid in the Boston area, we were all on the same BBS, the kids known as the loft. And you guys familiar with the loft, right? So I call this picture the loft supper, right? This was in Mudge We Trust. The guy in the middle with the hair is Mudge. So 20 years ago, uh, the very first cybersecurity caucus meeting eff effectively in the Senate was held and they invited hackers um, and we, you know, we as hackers have been warning about the fragility of the internet for a very, very long time, at least 20 years. So a couple weeks ago, I was privileged enough to go to the reunion. So you can see not much has changed. I mean, our hair has changed. Definitely our hair has changed. Uh, Mudge brought that wig. That, I didn't bring that for him. He brought it himself. Um, but they went over some of the things that were the same, some of the areas that our industry has improved upon. But if you think about it, 20 years ago to today, we've spawned a multi-billion dollar industry. But breaches are still happening, right? So what's the new hotness? Bug bounties. Have you all heard of bug bounties? Yeah. Good, you're awake too, that's great. Um, so right now, bug bounties are being touted as the next greatest thing, right? I'm partially responsible for some of this hype, and I'll go into that in a, in a minute. But have we actually jumped the shark? So for those of you who aren't as old as I am, I'm just going to explain what this means so you don't have to look it up. Basically means it, it was from a TV show called Happy Days, and they wrote an episode where Fonzie, the, one of the main characters, water ski jumps over a shark, literally. And so they were saying that the writers had run out of ideas, that this very popular thing had just, you know, it's over the hill. So 
when I talk about bug bounties jumping the shark, I feel like we're at an inflection point right now. Because while they're completely useful and I believe in them for a lot of things, how they're being used has been a little bit problematic uh, over the past couple years in my observation. So how did we get here? So like I said, we keep throwing money at this problem. Lots of money. Lots of us have been making a lot of money dealing with this problem. But the cost of data breaches keeps going up and we don't seem to see any end in sight. And it seems like whatever we're doing and whatever we're spending and whatever we're advising our customers to do, there's still going to be you know, an attack surface to exploit. Um, I think you saw some great penetration testing talks yesterday that really went through some of the, some of the uh, attack surface and some of the ways that you get past them. But everything is still broken, right? We're still having these worms. We're still having this window of exposure between even when the patch is available and when the patch is deployed. So when I think about identification of bugs, I think about the fact that knowing is half the battle. Right? And a bug bounty is just another way to know about the bugs. So this is a Google search I did a couple weeks ago. And it was on the terms bug bounty and penetration test. How many of you believe that they're the same? Good. OK. So you know what? The title of the talk was These Aren't the Bugs You're Looking For, because that's really about figuring out who among you is a sheep who is following you know, the uh, marketing of the bug bounty companies and who among you is starting to see something else emerge. So what I'm seeing here is the convergence of Google search terms between bug bounty and penetration test leads me to believe that there is a lot of adoption of this idea, this erroneous idea, that a bug bounty is just a more cost-effective replacement for a penetration test. Now, I'm highlighting two inflection points in this timeline. Google only tracks this all the way going back to 2004. The first inflection point was five years ago. And uh, it wasn't the Snowden leaks. That's not what it was. Um, it was the announcement of the Microsoft bug bounty programs. So how many of you remember that? Five years ago, Microsoft went from just a couple years before saying they would never pay for security vulnerabilities to offering, at the time, the highest ongoing bug bounty of any vendor at $100,000 was, was the top ongoing bug bounty for mitigation bypasses. So that was a huge inflection point. That was the first time a company other than Google, a major company other than Google, offered cash rewards uh, directly to finders of its vulnerabilities. We had third parties offering cash rewards for a long time. Every, everyone here of the ZDI initiative, right? So that had been going on for a while, but this was the first time Microsoft had done it. So all of a sudden, a lot of big companies started looking at themselves and saying, if Microsoft can make this work, how could I make this work? So we saw a big jump in the popularity. The second inflection point, is Hack the Pentagon. How many of you heard of Hack the Pentagon? Any participants? Anybody participate? Yes, all right, great. Hope you got a coin. Did you get a coin? Okay, sweet. So, um, and maybe some money too, right? But uh, Hack the Pentagon was the result of over a couple of years of me being invited to the Pentagon to advise them on how they might construct something when they've got the entirety of the DOD to protect. They've got their own internal uh, security folks looking for vulnerabilities. They've got external third-party vendors. But something happened where there was a convergence of opportunity. They were looking at bringing in new ideas from you know, Silicon Valley, from, from industry, effectively. New ideas and new products more quickly into the Pentagon and into the DOD. So they had formed something called DDS, Digital Defense Service. DDS was a place where you could bring your cell phones inside the Pentagon, not have to lock them up. Uh, they were running Slack, you know, all kinds of things that they were able to like fast track into the Pentagon. And they even had a little BB-8 busting out of the wall because they considered themselves the Rebel Alliance inside the Pentagon. So it was this group that ended up launching Hack the Pen Pentagon. And at that point, everybody thought, well, clearly, if the DOD is doing it, Microsoft is doing it, all these companies are doing it, it must be effective, and we have to go start a bug bounty. 
not so. So I'm going to summarize very quickly. This audience, I think, is sophisticated enough to know the difference between vulnerability disclosure, penetration testing, and there are variances in penetration testing, including you know, the low end, just vulnerability scanning, to the traditional pen testing, to the red teaming. There are all those variances enclosed in that. But it's effectively uh, that category of bug hunting is under NDA. And it's remediation with a timeline you can control, right? Bug bounty programs are something different. They're, they are often called crowdsourced penetration testing, but it's more than that. Um, they're becoming sort of a hybrid between traditional penetration testing and a full-on crowdsource model. And that's facilitated by the bug bounty companies that are out there. There are basically two major platforms, and then one that sort of does a very, I think they're a sponsor here, one that sort of does a much more traditional alignment with penetration testing and does a lot of vetting of their folks. But even with all of this, even with the ISO standards that cover all of vulnerability disclosure, including the back-end processes, even with a 20-year history of penetration testing in this industry, and the more recent popularity of bug bounties, 94% of the Forbes Global 2000 still lack a front door. If you see something, you can't really say something very easily. And this is a problem. So how many of you have heard of these ISO standards? OK, great. So they've been out for about four years. And uh, a revision is coming out of both of them this, this year, sometime. Um, and that's, that revision is going to have more in terms of the um, uh, supply chain vulnerability coordination, like the meltdown inspector type of coordination that you've seen. So how do you do this? You just open the front door, throw up a mailbox, start a bug bounty program. Maybe you were expecting friendly hackers, right? Friendly, friendly. Like maybe there will be a rush, but they're, they're cuddly. They're white hats, right? I hear that term all the time. You know, I fought with Microsoft when we were blogging about the initial bug bounty program saying, we want to welcome white hat hackers to come and tell us about vulnerabilities. And I said, I actually don't care what color hat they're wearing. If they bring us a valid bug, they bring us a new mit mitigation bypass, I actually do not care, right? So maybe you had a more realistic expectation, and maybe you were expecting something more like this, right? But how do you actually distinguish friend from foe? How many of you right now are in organizations that run bug bounty programs? No, none of you, OK. Not even the sponsors who are bug bounty folks, OK. Um, <laughs> great. That goes to show. Um, it is difficult to tell friend from foe. You know, part of the issue here is incident response, right? Your incident responders still have, have some kind of burden to investigate a lot of issues. Some of the platform providers can help you by uh, you know, providing a whitelisted uh, IP range where a lot of their hackers are going to be coming from if they have a platform. But that doesn't actually solve all your problems, right? Last year, the Department of Justice issued guidance around creating vulnerability disclosure programs and bug bounty programs. How many of you have seen that DOJ guidance? So the DOJ guidance, in summary, basically walks you through some of the things that you have to think about, whether you're opening up a vulnerable disclosure program or a bug bounty program. And that's all around data, data privacy. So any Uber customers in the room? You, none of you rode Uber here. Come on. All right. So you heard there was a 57 million records breached and uh, paid out $100,000 to a Florida man. Why is it always a Florida man? Um, paid out 100 grand to a Florida man uh, to delete the 57 million records. That was paid out through their bug bounty program. Now, he apparently didn't know about the bug bounty program. He came in and he said, look what I can do, and give me one million dollars, something like that. And they said, how about uh, 10,000? That's the top of our bug bounty program. And he's like, how about six figures? And they caved and they gave it to him. Ten times the amount of the top bug bounty payout published on their site, and they paid it to him for downloading all of your data. So now Uber has changed their terms. Now it says, if you encounter data that you weren't supposed to see, stop right there. It literally says, stop right there. So they've thought it through now that they've been forced to appear before the Senate. But the fact of the matter is, this is only one of the aspects that you need to think about. And NDAs are not helpful in this, right? NDAs are something that, you know, makes sense in terms of a penetration test. But it's all about authorization. If you're familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, 
it's only illegal if you're not authorized. Penetration testers are authorized via contract. They're acting on your behalf, at your direction. So any data they find is not a data breach. When you get into bug bounty land, things get a little shakier, right? So this, this Florida man did sign an NDA, but does that protect him as a bug hunter? No, it does not. So one of the things that I did with the Department of Justice, with the DOD, was craft a scope that very legally walked this line. It gave authorization to people to scan for vulnerabilities and report those vulnerabilities. But it didn't provide a blanket, I don't know, diplomatic immunity for any prosecution worldwide. It literally says, if you follow this scope, we won't bring legal action against you. If a third party does, we'll stick up for you. We'll say that you were following our, our guidelines. Because they know that they can't actually protect you if a third party decides to press legal action. This is especially important in the cases of these data breaches. How many of you heard about uh, T-Mobile? Or how many of you are T-Mobile customers? Did you do that whole, uh, did you get prompted to do that whole reset, uh, setting a passcode for, for uh, doing anything um, with your account? Did you have to walk through that? Well, if you did, if you didn't, I would go to the website and go do that. But, um, but the thing was, what happened was a bug bounty was paid out, $1,000, to someone who discovered an API open to the public that would allow anyone who knew your phone number to get your location, to do all kinds of things that really only employees of the company should have been able to do with authorization. So a thousand bucks, and the company released you know, a statement, as they do, saying there's no evidence of exploitation of our customers, but we are taking precautions and having everyone set a passcode. Once that article was published, the reporter was contacted by someone who had evidence that in fact, that API was being abused by criminals who were selling information um, you know, back and forth and was given evidence that this was true. So if you, you ascribe to the idea that bug bounties can help you prevent breaches, well, they'll help tell you things that maybe you didn't know. But if you take another look at it, just take one step back, was $1,000 paid to a stranger on the internet really necessary to tell you that you should not put APIs on the internet without authorization that can allow all of your customer data to be leaked out. I don't think that's a great use of a thousand bucks. And in fact, no breach was prevented. I still haven't seen the breach notification, by the way. So I'm a T-Mobile customer. So what happens when we get to an era where there is much more automation in bug hunting? Many of you heard of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge? Yeah, so it basically was a contest by DARPA where they said, make some AI that can automatically find and exploit vulner vulnerabilities and at the same time, go ahead and patch it on their own systems. So kind of automated warfare and defense. I remember talking to the DARPA folks before they launched this competition and they said, what would happen? Wouldn't it be great if we could sponsor a contest and you know, 10,000 new bugs could be found a day. And I was like, do you realize how you would overwhelm every single security response organization in the world? Every single one, including Microsoft. And they've been doing it for a very long time. Now, I wanna take a pause here. How many of you are local to Richmond? Oh my gosh, so many. How many of you were around, I don't know, was it three nights ago? Three nights ago when, um, when this happened, this, <laughs> so turns out I follow this guy on Twitter and he follows me back. Um, for those of you who don't know, he, uh, he apparently, um, he's played a CTF here before, not, I think not last year, but a couple years ago. Um, this guy, this guy apparently took a joyride in an armored personnel carrier a.k.a. a tank without guns, right? He was tweeting at the same time. He was saying, where is the damn water buffalo? And all kinds of things with some profanities that I'll keep off of the, uh, off of the recording, but you can read it yourself there. Now, yes, I am, I am tanking him for his service. I do tank him. Um, uh, but no, seriously, though, um, I'm really glad nobody got hurt. I'm really glad he didn't get hurt. 
I've got a couple of numbers and some hotlines and some text numbers down there because seriously, uh, he was actually deployed at one time in Afghanistan, 2008-2009, uh, I believe. And while this is hilarious um, because no one got hurt, clearly, you know, this was a cry for help. But how does this apply to bug bounties? Yes, this was a guy who rage forked Tor a few years ago or a couple years ago, um, in addition to his joyriding. But really, the main thing is that his defense, he says, he had authorization. That he was just running a test. How many times do you think somebody who is legitimately attacking you might use your vuln disclosure pro program or your bug bounty policy as a cover? Let's just, let's just see how that works out for a second. Is there sound? Just imagine. There it goes. Yeah, so ended just a few blocks away, I guess started in daylight, so this went on for a couple of hours where they were chasing this guy, where he claims he had authorization. Now, <laughs> the th <laughs> two hours, right? The thing is, this, these are your incident responders, right? They're chasing after what may or may not be a benign incident. Maybe it's just a test, you know? Well, they tased the heck out of him anyway, right? So, all right, so how do, I, how do I stop this thing? Oh my God, all right, stop. No, we don't need to see it again, okay. Okay, all right, fine. So how, how do we contain this um, explosion of enthusiasm to test our systems? Well, the bug bounty platforms will tell you they will manage the flood. They will hand select only the valid vulnerabilities. They will deduplicate it for you. But how many of you have ever sat on the business end of triage before. How many of you love that job and like wish it could never end, right? Never end, never ever. Right, so the bug bounty companies are taking away a lot of the pain points for you. But if you think about it, the penetration testing companies already did that. They were providing you with a report with no duplicates, ideally. I mean, some of them are terrible, but the good ones are providing you with a report with validated vulnerabilities with uh, no duplicates, with ideally, you know, an overall picture of what an attacker might be able to do. They're not going to find everything. Neither is a bug bounty, right? So yes, the bug bounty uh, companies rely on this. But, you know, I worked at Microsoft. Hmm. <laughs> seven years. I should get like seven little windows tattooed down my face. So um, Microsoft has the biggest response funnel of any organization in the world. And they probably have the biggest response funnel of all other organizations combined, quite frankly, of people trying to report unique vulnerabilities to them at Secure at Microsoft. 150,000 to 200,000 non-spam email messages a year coming into Secure at Microsoft. You know what that got us? Labeled in popular science as one of the top 10 worst jobs in tech. Between whale feces researcher and elephant vasectomist, somewhere in there, we made t-shirts with the list and we were in there. So this is not, this is a role that's hard to fill. It's hard to keep people in it. And if you think about the business models of these bug bounty companies, yes, they're filling that role, but they're not filling it with full-time employees who are making six figures and still trying to claw their way out of there. You know, it's like Silence of the Lambs where the, in the well you see the fingernails. It was like that in the hallways of the MSRC at the 12 month mark when you could go and get a different job in Microsoft, yeah. So, turns out there is such a thing as too much chocolate. I don't, I'm not giving up my lady card just because I say I don't like chocolate. Um, but the, uh, the thing is, the back-end infrastructure is what you really need to take care of. These are the people inside your organization that are there to protect the organization, prevent vulnerabilities from even leaving the gate. And if you're burning them out, with a flood of vulnerabilities, even if it's a clean feed, even if it's all chocolate, right? You are actually doing yourself some harm. So I'm really talking about balance and maturity. So I could do an entire talk about vulnerability coordination maturity. I do several talks about it. But the idea is this. It's not just about engineering when it comes to your capabilities in handling vulnerabilities, right? It's not as simple as a hand wavy, oh, you just need to crawl, walk, run. Just try it out and you'll be okay. There's a ton of stuff you have to think through, not the least of which is what happens when someone accidentally or deliberately 
breaches data, right? So the majority of bug bounties today, this is how the ecosystem has been shaping up. There's a whole lot of bug bounties out there that are saying, come after my web application, but they've actually replaced a lot of their internal due diligence with just doing this bug bounty. So guess what? The majority of findings are cross-site scripting. How many of you have found cross-site scripting vulnerabilities accidentally? Yeah, a few, right? SQL injection accidentally. I used to live on O'Farrell Street with an apostrophe. That caused a lot of accidents in my time. I didn't mean to. I just filled in my street name, and I got a verbose SQL error. Look at that, right? But you can't pen test your way to being secure, and you can't bounty your way to being secure. So a lot of these companies are saying, we take security very seriously. We have a bug bounty program. But they're over here playing whack-a-bug with some low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities that somebody else could have found more cost-effectively and at lower risk. But instead, they're looking like they're paying out a whole lot. They're fixing a whole lot. But it's a lot of busy work. And it's stuff that should have been caught further up the chain. So some of the MIT Sloan research that I did was around uh, system dynamics in the vulnerability economy and exploit market. In order to understand that, you have to understand vulnerabilities. This is a little bit of an eye chart. I have references at the end of this presentation, so you can read the whole paper if you want. But the whole thing is not all bugs are created equal, right? There are vulnerabilities that are easy to find, easy to fix, easy to discover, all those things. There's a whole matrix of different kinds of bugs. There's a market for vulnerabilities. Let's not lie. But not all vulnerabilities are sold on the offense market. You know, you're, much as you think it's very important, your podunk website, you know, that nobody's ever heard of, they're not trading your bugs on the dark market. Sorry, you know? So market dynamics is something you need to understand if you're a popular target. But not everybody has that impetus. So sometimes people just throw out a bug bounty. They don't know what they're doing. They think they want ants, they get bees, right? The whole point is not all of the bugs are created equal, and not all the bugs are gonna be of equal value to you. One of the biggest complaints I have when customers come to me saying, can you help us fix our bug bounty program, is they say, well, we're getting a lot of bugs, but none of them are critical. So it's spinning up my team to investigate and remediate valid but low severity bugs. So there's your team getting their cycles just taken up by, yeah, they're bugs, and yes, they should be fixed, but nothing good, nothing really juicy. Right, so let's talk through the myths and motivations in markets. It's a myth that bug bounties are the end goal of any vulnerability coordination program. Not everybody should be having a bug bounty. I just came from a physical security conference, the very first one that, that was trying to focus on cybersecurity. Mostly these are... Uh, camera manufacturers, the, um, you know, the, the electronic door lock folks, and integrators. And at the end of a panel, the integrators asked, should we, the integrators, have a vuln coordination program? And I said, yes, probably, but you can't directly fix the vulnerabilities in the vendors that you resell and repackage. You have to rely on them. So you have to work through your contracts with your partners in order to even have an appropriate vuln coordination program. But the integrators figured it out. They're the ones left holding the bag when it came to support, when it comes to bug reports to their customers. But does that mean that an integrator should be offering a bug bounty, you know, once they kind of work out those contracts? Not necessarily. They'd be dangling cash in front of somebody else's IP. So think through, when everyone's saying everybody needs a bug bounty, think through what your business model actually is. Another myth? Hackers will only exchange bugs for cash. That is not true. Before Microsoft offered those uh, high bug bounties, people were coming in at a rate of a couple hundred thousand reports a year. This was all for free. Even when there was a very active and is a very active offense market that would take those bugs off their hands if they wanted to. When I was a penetration tester, my specialty was Robin Banks. I miss Robin Banks. Um, and... Uh, the thing was, you know, you could certainly, as a pen tester, have kept some vulns to yourself and used them later for fun, for profit, resold them. Same thing is true of bug bounty hunters. But I and many of you, like Galadriel, handed Frodo the ring back, decided, nope, temptation gone, and we can go into the West, you know, with, our, with the rest of the elves, right? Um, so it is a myth that cash is the only motivator. 
Non-monetary incentives are huge. It's a myth that you have to outbid the offense market. That was part of the system dynamics research that, that I did with MIT. Because effectively, you get into an area of perverse incentives, which I'll talk about in a second, if bug bounty amounts go too high. A lot of people really, you know, Twitter experts, experts on Twitter, love to argue with me about this point. They love to say, no, no, I, I, I think you're wrong. I think as the bug bounty amounts go up, no perverse incentives will happen. No, it's perfectly fine to pay people a quarter million dollars per certain vulnerability. And no, I don't worry at all that my own employees might collude with outsiders. No, I don't, I don't worry at all that my own developers and QA folks might quit, wait out the, the waiting period, and then just start feeding me bugs from the outside. But in fact, I've seen these things occur. They do occur. So you can't, in fact, outbid the offense market. There is a logical ceiling before which you will start shanking your own recruiting pipeline. You will just start punching holes in it. So what is the truth? Bug bounties are not a replacement for penetration testing. All of you pen testers out there, breathe. <sighs> it's okay. You're, you're not going to be replaced. They don't alone, in and of itself, indicate maturity when it comes to taking security seriously. We all have a mix of motivations, right? The way that I explain it to people, it's not ever about black hat and white hat. How many of you have never broken the law? Honest people, not a single hand went up. Okay, so the way that I, <laughs> it's a different, different kind of uh, thing that happens when I do this in DC. A lot of hands go up. <laughs> hmm. Um, but everyone has, you know, maybe missed a, a, a red light, right? Everyone is, has made some kind of a judgment call at a yellow light. And the way that I describe this is hackers will make a judgment call. Not with every bug, but with certain bugs. They will decide, what am I going to do with this bug? Not necessarily, who am I going to sell it to, but do I really want to report it to this organization that threatened me with legal action last time? Or do I want to just pretend I never saw it, right? That's a very big decision that happens with, with a lot of hackers. And as I said, the truth about the defense market, when you are paying for bugs, it can only go so high. This is just a screen cap of the system dynamics model that we did um, you know, for, uh, in that MIT research. And it is published in an MIT, uh, an MIT book um, as a chapter in that book. And I have references at the end. But the idea was, if money isn't the lever, what is? Our conclusion with this was, was actually encouraging um, creation of tools, not tools like fuzzers that can find potential bugs, but tools that can determine exploitability. Because remember that triage job that everybody hates, whale feces, elephant vasectomies, in there? That job is made better by tools, right? It's made a little bit better by tools if you don't have to manually try and determine the exploitability of an issue. So that actually would make, uh, would make a little bit of, of, of a of a shift in terms of offense versus defense. So perverse incentives. Somebody stuck this comic from 1995 on my door right after launching the Microsoft bug bounty programs. Ha, 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 right? This is one of those perverse incentives I was talking about. Yes, we were offering $100,000, but you know, it was for a mitigation bypass. It was for a technique. It wasn't for a single bug, wasn't even for a single exploit. Why did we come up with that number, $100,000? Because the pwn to own competition, which was the white hat competition uh, that happens every year, that was the top prize that year. So we were matching white market prices, we were making it available year round, and it was for something that was sufficiently rare that the people we paid inside of Microsoft to find and prevent these things, they made a lot more money than $100,000, right? So we, we did not actually create a perverse incentive, even with a six-figure payout. So what are you looking at right here? That graph is the actual graph that I use to convince Internet Explorer to buy their own vulnerabilities. The white mark, that little low squiggly line, was the number of what they call bulletin class vulnerabilities, so critical or important level vulnerabilities that were found and reported to Microsoft during the beta period of IE10. It's a very low number. And then the big white spike after that break in the graph, that was the actual 
number of vulnerabilities that were reported in that category right after the beta period was over. Why did this mass of friendly hackers, this was before we had bug bounties, why did this mass of friendly hackers who were willing to report these bugs to us for free wait until the least convenient time to tell us poor Microsoft security grunts about this problem? We had inadvertently created a perverse incentive of our own. Acknowledgement in a bulletin. So what we said was, you know, if you report something to us, keep it quiet until we fix it, we'll put your name in a bulletin. And they said, great, unless it's in beta and we fix it in beta. There's no bulletin. So they were holding them. So I told IE, I said, hey, you want those bugs at the beginning of the beta period? Well, how about we put a bounty at the beginning of the beta period? And so I projected that we could do a little traffic shaping. We're going to get the same bugs. We might get one or two players who were only interested in you know, participating if there was money involved. But really, we were just using the crowd we had that were already looking at us, and we were focusing their laser-like eyes on the period of time that we needed those bugs the most, and it worked. We got 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities in the first 30 days of IE11. Want to guess how much I paid for those 18? Each of those, by the way, would have been worth six figures on the offense market. I paid around $28,000 total for those. And why, why was this important? Well, I had the budget to pay for many, many more. But the fact, fact of the matter is, we needed to prove that this model could work. In an organization that had over 800 supported products and services, we had to prove that there was a way to make it work win-win for both Microsoft, who was already going to get the bugs anyway, the finders, who were probably already going to give them to us. But it made it at a time and place that was much more advantageous for everyone. And they got to be famous, because we made a big deal about it. The check on the right is the very first $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty check. That, uh, that's not my signature. Um, that I wrote for, it was a giant check, actually, because James asked for a giant check. James and the giant check. But um, he, uh, he had found the very first mitigation bypass. This actually came into play a lot at the Wassenaar renegotiations when I was getting those exemptions for vulnerability disclosure. One, they assumed that all vuln disclosure ended with public release of all details, so they thought it was already exempt. And I'm like, actually, no. Techniques are something that you might not fully release. Because even if you fix the technique, uh, an exploitation technique in the latest version, it might still work on older versions where you can't fix it architecturally, right? And they were like, huh. And I also basically re uh, read the mitigation bypass bounty language right alongside the Wassenaar language for technology controls, and it was almost identical. And I said, if Microsoft can't get a heads up on these new things that take them years to fix, you are impeding the security of the internet by doing this. So it was actually quite important that I had these examples. This was launched, this program was launched six months before that Wassenaar arrangement took effect. We launched five years ago in June of 2013. Wassenaar was signed in December of 2013. If I had missed that window, these programs would never have existed. I hate doing policy stuff, but sometimes it's necessary. So this was the Pentagon. And I am conscious of time, and I want to make sure that you get all your breaks, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. This was the Pentagon. Look at the numbers. This looks very successful, right? 138 valid reports, you know, in a 21-day period. Time it took to receive the first phone report. FYI, don't start your bug bounties at midnight. Do not do. Um, <laughs> but look at the signal to noise, right? We weren't sure if anybody was going to participate in this thing. You had to pre-register. You had to put your social security number in there. I had a lot of hacker friends going, I'm not going to give them my social security number. And I said, honey, the government gave you that number. <laughs> they know who you are. And they said, no, but you know, as they're tweeting, right, publicly, no, but they're going to send me to Gitmo once they know I'm a hacker. And I'm like, they know that too. <laughs> they already know. <laughs> So yes, um, 1,400 people registered, and we were surprised. So that signal to noise was pretty bad, though, right? That meant a lot of duplicates, a lot of disappointed folks, a lot of people who, um, you know, they might have found a valid vulnerability, but they weren't the first to report it. There were these awesome coins, though. See, they, they looked like that 
hack the Pentagon. I don't know if you can see, there's binary around there, and it translates to, I hacked the Pentagon. So we launched Hack the Army, and this was Secretary Fanning of the Army at the time. And uh, right after this photo was taken, he asked, hey, so for our coin, for the Hack the Army coin, could it say, I hacked the Army and beat Navy? <laughs> we were like, yeah, sure, why not, you know? And they did. They did beat Navy. I blame hackers. Anyway, so look at the numbers here. This is a much better signal to noise, isn't it? What was the lever that was used? They capped the participation. So even though it was another bug bounty challenge, time limited, et cetera, they actually limited it by participants in order to manage the signal to noise. Still, and they also started at noon because, I mean, my God, having five minutes after midnight for the first Vuln report, not a good look. So you can, you can iterate on these programs lessons learned, but the fact of the matter is, this is a finite labor market. Do you know what else was launched I don't know, maybe partway through the Hack the Pentagon challenge? The Pornhub bug bounty. That distracted a few bug hunters. <laughs> Their eyes went from the Pentagon and the patriotism to the Pornhub. <laughs> Honey, I'm up doing research. I'm making us money. <laughs> True statements, all these things happen. But there's a tiny fraction of talent out there. There's a huge base of noisemakers. Tiny fraction of talent. You have to attract their eyes, and as I said, you can't do it all with money. Why do we keep seeing these same Vuln classes? Well, I have a few theories. But the fact that the top 10 university programs in the United States graduating new computer scientists, I am not a computer scientist, by the way. I'm a molecular biologist, a mathematician. But anyway, the computer scientists that they're graduating out of here, none of these programs require security courses in order to graduate with a degree in computer science. So we are harvesting a lot of low-hanging fruit because the kids these days, the kids these days are, uh, you know, they're writing a lot of bugs. So when we think about the labor market, it's not just a labor market of bug hunters. It's a labor market of developers and fixers, the people that you don't want to burn out on the other end. Poor Lucy, poor Ethel in the chocolate factory. That's who that was, young people, by the way. That black and white photo of the chocolate, that's that, it's from I Love Lucy. So... What are we doing with this? Well, unfortunately, the insane popularity of bug bounty programs means that now it's being legislated, not only in the United States, but in Europe. We have a chance to course correct here, but they're going with a foregone conclusion that we're going to replicate the success of Hack the Pentagon. But you can see about the iterations that it took to try and kind of get, that, get through that Hack the Pentagon, try and make it manageable. It is a misunderstanding of the amount of work that it takes to get ready for these things. Even the folks who had worked on Hack the Pentagon from the inside say that this is not appropriate to apply to other agencies in the United States government by law. That's what Hack the DHS is, Hack the State Department. In Europe, they made a $1.2 million budget increase for bug bounting open source software. They did a survey as to which open source software was more widely used across EU governments. They came up with Apache Server and KeePass. They released a call for tender. I hear Tinder every time I say that, so. But they released a call for tender for that, for bug bounty companies to bid on managing that. I reached out to the Apache Server guys. They had no idea that the EU was about to paint a bounty target on their back, and the EU had not budgeted for additional maintainers. So think this through. It's getting very popular, but nobody is thinking about who is going to catch those bugs on the back end. I don't want any of your organizations to make the same mistake. So they are good for some things. Focusing those eyes, recruiting, finding new talent, finding bugs you missed only after you perform your own due diligence. Because right now, you know, the breaches are happening and the shame is raining down on the diligent and negligent alike. Bug bounties are really terrible for your very first time receiving a bug. A lot of folks come to me and say, we really want to start a bug bounty. And I say, how many bugs do you typically receive per year through your normal Vuln Disclosure channel? And they say, we've never. We've never actually received a bug. We don't have a front door to report. And I'm like, okay, you're going to have a bad time. 
okay? So we're not going to do that to you. It's also terrible for employee morale. When those large bug bounties are, are rolling through and people on the outside are spending not, not an entire year finding a bug, right? Finding, finding a bug in some fraction of that time, and it's more than the salary of, or the bonus of the person who is slogging away trying to fix these things and prevent these things, you will eventually lose not just the people who work for you, but again, if 20 years ago when I was young, if I could have made money doing bug bounties, do you think I ever would have gotten those Microsoft tattoos on my face? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know how many young people who have a talent and a knack for this will put up with major mega corporate politics and build their careers over time if they can make a good, decent, or even outstanding living doing bug bounties. So watch your incentives. And finally, data privacy. I went over some examples. More and more are hitting every day in terms of violations of data privacy that are not taken care of by bug bounty terms. So what are you going to do? Audit yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Build something sustainable. I mean, I know that you know, I'm a middle-aged woman with pink hair, but I, I can tell you from experience that you don't last this long if you don't take care of yourself. Take care of yourself, take care of your organizations, and bring balance to that labor workforce. It's not all just about be all, end all, find those bugs. Somebody's got to catch them, someone's got to fix them, and when those people are gone, you have to have the mechanisms in place to not just repeat the process, but actually learn from those bugs. Every bug could represent a crisis averted, but never waste a good crisis, right? You never want to waste a good crisis. And then finally, if you do start doing incentives, try and think through the implications of perverse incentives in your organization. If you start offering very high bounties, even if you offer them with a, uh, an offer of employment, are you going to actually be able to retropay your existing folks those sized bonuses? Because effectively, it ends up being a signing bonus. I mean, I hear these, these murmurs from Apple who are offering, what, quarter million dollars as their top, saying, well, we might just bump it up to a million. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you want to have anyone working for you at the end of the day? Because you creep up into these perverse incentive numbers very quickly. So in everything, we have to strive for balance. I am a terrible meditator. I can't clear my thoughts at all. But the one thing that has always been clear to me is that in my youth, it was much easier to destroy than it was to create and certainly, I wasn't interested in maintenance. Um, you can imagine how many liquids and gels it takes. I always have to check a bag for maintenance you know, of, of the things that we love. But many cultures have this idea of balance. Our culture, security culture, needs to stop being so enamored with the bugs. It's always the bugs, the bugs, the bugs. But sometimes it's not about the bugs. It's about the people and the processes that you have on the back end to support what you do. So I hope that you guys have learned a couple things, had a little myth busting. If not, I've got some references up here. And I thank you so much, RVA Sec and Jake. Thank you.